We are delighted that you're joining us for another podcast of Wake Up Align, and it is the podcast for chiropractors where we get to talk about chiropractic, chiropractic lifestyle, and topics of interest. You can contact us through our email, and that is mailbag at amcfamily.com. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Wake Up Align. I'm your host, Dr. Shannon McMurtry, and uh, get to fly solo today. Kind of excited about that. Snacks, a little nervous. Don't think I've ever carried an episode on my shoulders all by myself. I won't tell you, audience, but uh, Snacks is not giving me any, any indication of encouragement. Uh, he is actually really m- more nervous than I am. So we're going to get right into it today. And I have a topic that I'm very passionate about. And I've been doing this topic on my mentoring calls with just about every one of the clients that I serve. And it's been a topic that has been transformational in how they look at their practice and what they're doing in their practice. This will be a two-parter. We will follow up uh, on implementation and taking this topic deeper into your staff to create some cultural shifts uh, in the second episode. So I'm excited that you're with us today, and I hope that you will get a lot out of this very important topic. You know, we were mentioning practices just a moment ago, and we always have an opportunity to share good news about the practices that uh, we are aligned with. And uh, I just want to just very quickly talk about uh, a few of those. Uh, There we have Dr. Angie, who is uh, uh, has set an all time record in her practice, and uh, she is not resting on her laurels. She has already got her next goal in front of her. And there is no doubt in my mind that uh, Dr. Skokos will be reaching that very soon. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Taylor Webb. Dr. Taylor Webb is a, a practitioner down in Texas. She is a brand new mom, just a lovely, lovely person all the way around. Um, and she had, uh, uh, on a particular day this week, 100% acceptance on a couple of the uh, financial plans that were presented to the patients related to their care plan that they were need- needing. So that's very exciting. Um, and then we have the best month ever in a 30-year-old practice, these are very, very sweet. This is a large group practices, group practice, multiple locations uh, in the state of Montana. Uh, and Doctors Neveker and uh, both Doctors Williams and Williams uh, have had their best month in the history of, of that group up there. And we are super excited for them. The sky is the limit. They have really just touched the the surface of the iceberg here uh, and there's a lot more potential ahead of them so congratulations to all of you that's just a very short um, telling of the long list of honorable mentions that are going on and uh, maybe in the second episode I'll bring some more to you let's get into the topic today Uh, my mentor Dr. Owen taught us that comparisons Comparisons for your patients are very, very important because comparisons is where your patients really begin to get a sense of value for what you're doing for them. I want you to be very careful and listen closely here because I didn't say doing to them. I said doing for them. And if you don't know this, if no one has ever shared this with you, I want to actually start there today. Your value, your worth, what you're paid by the patient is a reflection of what you do for somebody, not what you do to somebody. There's a uh, old story out there. It's probably been told ever since plumbers were a profession, but the uh, the the household owner is um, having trouble with their plumbing, and you know can't get it fixed, and Call finally relents, calls the plumber out. The plumber comes out, crusty old guy in his overalls, and looks up down the the water heater or whatever the appliance is, and takes out his hammer, 
taps it three times on the valve. Thing works. It was a miracle fix. Homeowner, homeowner is absolutely astonished. How did you do that? What? How much do I owe you? Oh, that'd be $150. And the homeowner goes apoplectic. Are you serious? You just tapped it three times, blah, 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 blah. Plumber says, you're not paying me for the taps. You're paying me to know where to tap. <laughs> and that is true. That's what you do. That's what I do for patients. It's not what you do to them. It's what you do for them. And that's a concept that you have to understand and you have to wrap yourself in every single day because the worth and the value is the change, is the improvement, is the impact, not the time that you spend with any particular person any given day. My mentor also said, as you're making comparisons, that people are more appreciative, more thankful, more enthusiastic about what you've saved them from as compared to what you've done for them. Right? So where they start in their care with you, the journey that they've had before they start care with you, is an important part of that patient's history. It's an important part of their psychology, how they think, how they feel, how they establish value in their case. And they're motivated by that. I don't want to pretend like they aren't. But they're more motivated and more appreciative of the future that they have in their mind that you've been able to prevent or turn around. And if you've ever had anything that was really stressing your future, a healthcare concern, a bill that was looming, a marriage that was not having, you know, <laughs> such a such a good season, and you think of the worst that can happen, when you get that fixed and the future becomes more secure, just ask yourself, think about that. Aren't you grateful? Aren't you appreciative? Don't you, aren't you enthusiastic about what that saved you from? Well, if the answer is yes, then the patients are the same way, right? They're dealing with the same innate as you and I are. In our program, in our system aligned, there are very specific moments where we talk about comparisons. In fact, one of the first is when we're actually doing our consultation with the patients. Doctors who are listening to this, if you don't do a consultation with your patients, you are missing the boat. You are out there on thin ice. You're not getting proper histories. You should be doing a consultation with all patients. Bottom line. Well, that's where... That's, that event is, is one of the places where we start the conversation of comparisons. Now, if you're listening to this and this is new to you, or you don't know how to do this, when to do it, what to say, how to say it, let me just make a recommendation to you. Contact Aligned. Contact us. Slide your pride to the side. Make a decision. Reach out, ask your questions. We know how to do this. And it's easy once you know the rules. And it's easy for you, but you have to take that first step. Okay, enough with the commercial. Let's get back to the topic. We have traditionally spoken with the patients about those comparisons and covered three or four main comparison areas. Those comparisons are cost, treatment, outcome, and, and what we're generally calling consequences. Now, you're not typically comparing what you've done or what you can do for, uh, in the office, what you've done for others, with other chiropractic care. Typically, we're comparing that to the medical care or the medical model. And there's a real challenge with being able to do that and do it authentically. Most of you don't know what the medical model is really about. You don't completely understand 
what patients are going through, how much it's costing, the impact it's having on their life. And when you are a healthy individual or you're under chiropractic care and you really just don't have a big need for a lot of medical intervention, then you have an ignorance of all of those factors. Now, we, people like us, can train that into you. But I've found that when you haven't experienced it yourself, it's hard to really go there fully. So we stay at this very superficial level of cost and consequences, and, and those are important, but that's not all. That's not all that we should be comparing. Because the patients have a history and an impact that goes way beyond cost or outcomes or consequences. I'm going to share with you the, the three that are off the radar for most of us, but extremely important. Comparative burden. Comparative engagement and comparative dignity. Dignity is one that I don't know if I've ever spoken about before when I've done comparisons. Certainly have not talked to patients about that. And when I'm talking about dignity, I'm talking about your personal dignity. When we're talking about engagement, we're talking about engagement with life. So when I did this exercise with my clients, and I, I touched on this subject over the course of about three weeks with just about everybody. Some profiles started to show up. So I want you to imagine, as you're listening to this, a patient who is on a healthcare journey. They're not doing well. And if you don't help them accept the fact, internalize the fact that they're going to continue to seek help in some way. You know, they don't leave your office, thanks but no thanks, doc, and then just go home and suffer. They're doing something. They're buying mattresses. They are going to the yoga studio. They're buying painkillers. They're, they're pursuing trying to get their problem fixed. And, and that's true no matter how much they minimize to you face-to-face -face as the doctor. Like, that's what the, the patients will do. They'll minimize the problem. Because they have a, a belief system, a concept that if they minimize the problem, the solution will be minimized. Now, if you buy into that and you accept that, then you have no ability to conceive of them going outside of your office, saying thanks but no thanks, and continuing, continuing to look for solutions. But that's the reality. If you don't help them, they're going to continue to find someone who can. When I was in practice, I was typically more the second or third or even final option for people rather than the first choice. Breaks my heart to see that. That's the pattern. I don't know if that's the case so much nowadays. I think it is changing, thankfully, where many of you are getting patients before they do anything else. But if they go the medical route and they have some typical neuromusculoskeletal issue, the pattern that they're going to go is very similar, regardless of the state, regardless of the, the area that you're practicing in. Okay? And we're going to go through this with some detail, because it's not enough just to gloss over it. It's not enough just to put the superficial... Uh, on the wall and, and see what sticks. So we've got patient, let's call her Marjorie. Marjorie is a very typical chiropractic patient. She's got a, a, a pain issue. She's got a neuromusculoskeletal based type problem. Um, and, you know, it is, it is, starting to show up on her peripheral nervous system. If Marjorie says to you, Doc, thanks for your offer to help. I do appreciate it. I'm just not comfortable with it. I can't afford it. I blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm going to go a different route. Marjorie's going to leave your office 
And if she goes the medical route, her first phone call is to who? Her primary care physician. Right? She's not going straight to surgery. She's not going straight to the imaging center. She has to go to the great gate, gatekeeper first. If she has a standing relationship with a family doctor, she's likely waiting two to three weeks to get in, depending on severity. If she doesn't have a relationship, let's say that she's new to the area, she doesn't have a relationship, she could have a four to eight week wait time to see that first appointment. Now, if you want to really look at what this actually looks like in your area, you can Google these. What's the average wait to get to a family practice doctor as a new patient, as an established patient? I don't think that'd be a great exercise. Not while you're driving, <laughs> not while you're doing other things, but get to know what your area looks like. Familiarize yourself with it. So let's say she's waiting, I don't know, four weeks for that appointment. You understand that the problem that she came in to see you for is still there for that whole four weeks. She's doing exactly what she said to you she was doing to try to relieve it. Maybe she's doing some other things. Maybe she's resting and, you know, maybe bumping up the over-the-counter painkiller. But she's suffering the whole time. She presents to the medical doctor's office, counting paperwork, waiting in the lobby, waiting in the exam room. She's probably got an hour and a half to two hours there. That medical doctor is going to do what they do, an exam, and then they're going to make recommendations. The recommendations are typically going to be a cocktail of medication, pain relievers, muscle relaxers, anti-inflammatories, or whatever, and further investigation. Further investigation could mean pain management. It could mean physical therapy. It could mean imaging. See, Marjorie has waited four weeks. She spent an hour of, or two hours of her life. She's got a few minutes face-to-face -face with this doctor. The doctor tells her, do this, and then we'll do this. Maybe they provide some sort of relief treatment there in the office. Maybe there's an injection or something. I'm, I'm not really sure. Marjorie goes to the front desk. She pays her copay. She's told, we'll file your insurance. Whatever is, isn't covered, we'll send you a bill. Do you need help setting up the next appointment with the PT or the pay management or whatever? And sometimes they'll just go ahead and make the referral for her. So she leaves. She probably goes directly to the pharmacy. She's got a 10 or 15 minute wait there. And she's got a copay per each script. Now, again, you should Google this in your area. What's the average copay to the family doctor in my area? What's uh, the average copay per, script, per prescription in my area? But Marjorie has incurred a time expense and a monetary expense for this. And she's just starting her journey. So she gets her scripts. She starts taking them. If they make her feel better, great. She's not suffering. She still has subluxation. She still has a future ahead of her, but at least she isn't suffering every day. And I'm glad for that. I don't want to see Marjorie suffer. She probably continues to follow through with the second recommendation. Maybe in this case, it's physical therapy. I'm going to start you there. We'll see how that goes. Now, in my area, the physical therapy is going to have about a half week to one week wait time. You will be in that first visit where they do the evaluation and possibly first treatment, roughly two hours. And there's going to be a cost associated with that treatment. And they'll also put you on a plan. The plan typically goes four weeks at three times a week. They usually go for 12 visits for that first month. So if you're keeping track, Marjorie has waited several weeks for the family practice doctor. She's waited another half week to week to get to the PT. And now she has four weeks ahead of her for her PT treatments. 
Something is happening that you're not aware of. Marjorie is running out of script because most doctors are writing the prescription for four weeks. And some of you actually said that. They're writing the prescription for four weeks. Marjorie, at the end of the PT, is at the end of her script. Now, again, if it's helping, great. She still, she still has subluxation. She still needs chiropractic care, but at least she's doing better. If it doesn't help, and how many of you have sat down with patients who it didn't help, who did this, that, and the other, and they're still no better or have gotten worse over time? It happens. So she's at the end of the PT. She's at the end of the scripts. So now she either has to call back into the medical doctor, which in my area they don't like to do. They don't like to call in scripts like that. They ask you to come back in to reassess and get another script made. Well, there's another wait period for that. Maybe it takes her two, three days this time as an established patient with an active case to get back to the medical doctor. She's got another one hour wait. She gets, you know, another piece of advice and another scription, prescription, and she has to go fill that. Her copay got dinged again for the office visit to the MD, and she'll have copays for the script prescriptions prescribed. She also had a copay and out of pocket for the PT. When I did this with my clients, that was averaging about $1,000 for the 12 visits. So she goes back to the pharmacy. She gets the prescriptions filled. She has another recommendation to go to pain management. Okay. Pain management is another about half week to one week wait to get in as the new patient. They're typically going to give her injections every two to three weeks over the course of about nine to 10 weeks. That's my area. If it helps, great. If it doesn't, if it doesn't, she still has a journey ahead of her. By the way, she has to be very careful about interactions with the medications. If pain management isn't helping and she still needs her script, she's got to get another supply of that because that's four weeks. That may mean another trip to the MD. Do you see how just in the very early stages here, the pattern is starting to show up that this is taking over? Marjorie's life is on hold. Marjorie's life is, in, is on limbo. Because Marjorie will do what you and I will do when we are hurting and suffering. I don't care if I have a, a trip planned next week. I don't care if I'm going on a cruise with my family. If I am hurting and suffering, and the doctor says, the first appointment that we have is four weeks, but if someone cancels, we'll get you in earlier. What do I do? What do you do? You cancel your plans and you sit by the phone, hoping and praying an appointment shows up. And we're not even, not even entertaining those side effects. But there are people who have to go to the doctor because the medication has caused them such severe constipation that they can't go to the bathroom anymore. That really happens. My wife works at a hospital. She directs the therapy department. And I get to hear stories of stuff that most of you are completely unaware of. But there's a reality here. And if you're not thinking about that, if you're not comparing what other people have done or what people are doing even today and comparing it to what you do and the results that you get with patients, you're really missing the boat for yourself and most importantly for Marjorie. Marjorie doesn't know this world. She's the patient. How could she possibly know what is ahead of her? She's looking at you to do that. I want you to think about something. Have you ever been grateful for something that is not on your radar? <laughs> I know it's kind of a trick question. But have you ever been grateful or thankful for the thing that didn't happen if you were unaware of it? Here's where I think the, the best example I can give you is. 
you drive on your roads every single day. To and from your office, running errands, grocery store, church, whatever it may be, you drive on your roads every single day. If you go on a long journey, a long trip, where you're driving across country or driving to a, you know, several, several hundred miles away, and you're so inclined, you might ask your church group to pray for you. Hey, we're taking a long trip. Pray for, pray for a safe journey. Why do you do that? Why do you do that? It, don't the stats say that you're much more likely to be in an accident close to home than you are away from home? So when you've got a long journey and you're not sure what's to come, you'll ask for prayers for safe journey. But do you ever pray for safe journey when you're running your day-to-day errands? See, it's, it's so common and it's so just part of your life that you don't think about the accidents that might happen unless one of two things happens. Then you'll have a reminder of the seriousness of an accident. Those two things are a near miss or you pass an accident. And you rubberneck and look around and say, oh, man, I'm glad that's not us. You know, that near miss happens. They swerve into your lane and you and you swerve and oh, all those adrenaline and emotions hit you. And sometimes you let bad words slip out. But once you get your composure, oh, thank you. I'm so grateful I was paying attention this time and and, you know, reacting to what. See, that's the when the gratitude sits in. Just like seeing the accident in the ditch. Doctors, Marjorie doesn't know that the roads are dangerous. She can't be grateful or appreciative. She can't ask for prayers on things that she has no idea of what's ahead of her. It's your job to remind her. It's your job to show her the near miss. It's your job to show her the accident in the ditch. Because you can't predict her healthcare future. I can't either. So the typical profile on this is Marjorie's going to go through the pain management. Again, if it works, it's great. If it doesn't, she's got other things to do. It's typically going to get referred out to surgeon, orthopedic neuro. That first step is x-rays, MRI or CTs or whatever. That means imaging center. Then she has to go back to the doctor for the report unless they're going to report it over the phone. If the doctor is real conservative, he may send her back to a different therapist, maybe somebody that specializes in her situation, maybe somebody that this doctor trusts. But if she continues to not get answers, not get help, not get solutions, you and I both know she's headed towards surgery. And the stats on the surgery is, after your first back surgery, you'll have your second within 10 or 15 years. So even after she has this intervention, she's not done. And in each moment along these attempts to get help, she's got a wait time for the appointment. She's got some amount of time spent in that particular facility or office. She has a copay or a cost associated When we added up the average with my clients, and this is about 30 people, the average profile was about half a year in waiting for appointments or going through treatment plans with people who are not chiropractors, about 30 hours of their life invested in inside of facilities or in front of doctors. And somewhere between eight and fourteen thousand dollars spent, and that's before that's before surgery. That's before surgery. So there's comparative cost. There's comparative treatment. It's just much more detailed. How long does it take a patient to typically turn the corner in your office? How long do they wait for that first appointment? Are you awaiting less practice? Do they wait two or three weeks? How long is that first appointment? How long are the totality of hours spent? How many hours spent in your office for those results achieved that when they start to turn the corner? 
Most people, it's around six to eight visits. Patient has spent a total of about three hours, plus or minus. And they've got, if they have a good price structure, <laughs> patients into them for about seven or $800 by then. Now think about that. They waited a week for your appointment. They've spent a total of three hours for seven or eight visits. They've incurred charges of about $800, and they're already working towards a solution. In half a year, 30 hours, several thousand dollars, they're still looking for an answer. That's comparison. So Marjorie's doing this, and her life engagement is already affected. Right? She's not going on the cruise She's not going out of town to see her cousin graduate from high school. She's going to muddle through um, the the wedding that's around the corner uh, for a family member. Uh, She's not taking the bucket trip um, uh, trip to um, the Grand Canyon with her husband. Date nights are over. She's not able to do the chores at the house. So now the children and the husband have to do those chores. See, Marjorie's issue now becomes a shared burden. At my house, I'm responsible for outside. So during the spring, summer, fall, I'm mowing the grass. I'm doing the trimming. I have a big place. That's about three hours, plus or minus. If I don't do that because I'm physically unable to, then somebody in my household has to. Do I like it that I'm not able to pull my weight at my household? Absolutely not. And if nobody in my household can do it or is willing to do it, because they're busy people too, I have to hire that out. That would be probably $150 each time it was done, my house. See, my issue now becomes a burden for other people. And those people are grateful to do it because they love me and they're happy to help out. Maybe the people at church have to come help me out. What's happening at Marjorie's Marjorie's workplace? She's not able to work, or at least work fully. Is she using PTO, sick days, family medical leave? Is her work just piling up on her desk? Or do people step in and cover her missed work? See, now Marjorie's issue is a shared burden at the workplace. Instead of sick days for the flu and other things. Now she's got sick days chasing this issue. Life engagement. Shared burden. When was the last time, when was the, (laughs) maybe this will be the first time you'll talk to the patient about those realities. What about shared dignity? You know, there are a lot of undignified moments in a health journey, especially when it gets out of, hold, out of hand. You know, if, if you get constipated because of the medication, the solution for that is undignified. I won't go into the details on it. When you can't get out of bed and your family has to help you, go to the bathroom or put a bedpan in. That's not very dignified. Years ago, I overdid it on my back and I had a sciatic episode. First time in my life. I was really bad for two days, kind of bad for about five. My wife had to roll me to my side in the bed so I could urinate. It's not very dignified, kind of embarrassing to admit. The journey to the bathroom when I had to do something else, which was 15 feet away, was a 45-minute walk to and from, and she had to help me. So. 45 minutes of her day to and from was missed. She had to help me down and up off of the toilet. I'm not trying to be gross. I'm trying to be real with you about dignity. There was one time that she wasn't there and I had to, I had to pee. I had no choice but to urinate on myself. That's not very dignified. Have you ever thought about carpal tunnel surgery and someone getting carpal tunnel surgery on their dominant hand? 
How do they go to the bathroom? How do they clean themselves after they go to the bathroom? If you're listening to this, you've never thought about that. Next time you go to the bathroom, try using your non-dominant hand. See how the results turn out. At my wife's hospital and in her specialty, part of what she does is assessing patients as they shower, and bathe, and use the bathroom to make sure they're not a risk of fall or whatever. Would you like someone watching you shower? Is there dignity in that? When my clients have thought about this and actually talked to their staff about it, the points that the staff is more concerned about is not cost or treatment or consequences. It's dignity, burden, and life engagement. So we're going to come back with a second episode, and we're going to talk about taking this to your staff and helping your culture to improve. I would love to hear your feedback on this. I'd love for you to reach out to us at mailbag at amcfamily.com. Let me know what you're thinking about this. You disagree? Let me know that. You agree? You're happy that we brought this up because you never thought about, about it before? I would love to hear that. So join us on that second part coming up where we're going to talk about taking this concept to your staff and improving the culture of your office. I have really enjoyed being with you today. I hope Snacks, hope I did a good job by myself. Hope I carried the burden. And I look forward to joining you next time. Until then, God bless. Follow our show. You can share it with friends, of course. And uh, we'd love for you to contact us at mailbag at amcfamily.com. In addition, you're always invited to attend or join us at a summit. Of course, registration is required. And we'd love for you to check out the loads of free content we provide to social media every single week. Until next time.